want to give a quick shout out to all of my patrons. Thank you so much for continuing to support my channel. Hey everybody, this is Matt from Matt's Fantasy Book Reviews and today I am going to be doing my most requested video and that is a full breakdown of everything Malazan. And I'm going to be doing this entirely spoiler free and ranging a lot of different topics that go over this entire series. Uh, ranging from, you know, my thoughts on the series, uh, why I think or don't think that you should be intimidated by this, reading tips, a ranking of the books, and more. So, with that said, let's start at the natural spot, and that is, what is Moazin all about? And I think the best way to start out explaining what this is, is a quote from Steven Erickson, one of the authors of this series, um, and there's two authors, we'll talk about that later, uh, and in, in his words, in an interview about what Moazin is, and he says, quote, the genre is epic fantasy, although the series could also be characterized as a dramatic history on an alternate world, one where magic works and the gods are active in the mortal realm. But this is not simply a history of nations, kings, queens, empires, and tyrants. Rather, the series explores life from every social stratum, among many cultures and civilizations, from petty thieves to soldiers on both sides of the conflict, to barkeeps to sorcerers, priests, demigods, and gods. The Malazan series recounts a period of history centered on one particular empire, the Malazan Empire, during a time of expansion and conquest, and how the empire becomes instrumental in the fundamental changes to the world once the gods weigh in. So that's what Steven Erickson says, but let's go over it in a little bit more detail here. So let's start with the plot. And now this plot is gonna be, have to be, you know, especially summarized here, um, leaving out entire books due to how many different plots are all happening at once uh, throughout um, Malazan Book of the Fallen's main 10 books. Um, so a group of soldiers known as the Malazans and a number of others team up to stop a growing problem in the world. Uh, the problem is the namesake of the 10th book, the crippled god. Uh, he was a foreign god uh, ripped from a different realm or universal world uh, through sorcery sometime in the past, and he's now causing a lot of problems. Uh, a religion has started uh, causing wars across multiple continents, um, and in general, these people are kind of being assholes. So thematically, and I think with Malazan, this is by far the most important part, this story really all boils down to compassion versus indifference. Um, suffering exists in this world uh, due to the indifference on a massive grand scale. Uh, the heroes of this story are the select few uh, that see value in fighting against the indifference with unconditional compassion. Now this shows up, uh, not necessarily in the first book or two, but this theme just continues to build up and up as the series goes along, uh, culminating in the most epic and greatest example of this uh, that I've ever seen in any work of any book. Now let's talk races. So in this book, you're gonna obviously see a lot of humans, but you're gonna see a lot of other things too. Now it's natural to think of this series as kind of being a Dungeons and Dragons-y type world. And that is indeed how the inspiration of this story started. But all of the races in this book besides humans uh, are invented by the creators here and they're terribly unique. Um, so there are insanely unique fantasy races here with very interesting magics, uh, very interesting backgrounds and histories. Let's pick a few of these. Um, and let's start with the Talan Amas. Uh, they're pretty much like Neanderthals who were forced into cursing themselves into immortality uh, to fight an endless war versus the Jagged, which is another race that uh, I don't even have time to explain, but they're entirely unique themselves. Uh, so now they are walking skeletons who have lost all sense of humanity, and they're fighting for their freedom that they've lost to achieve ultimate victory against their enemies. Um, another race in here that I want to highlight is the Kachain Shamal. Um, these are sentient dinosaurs with advanced modern technology, and they have uh, literally have swords for arms. Uh, one of the coolest readings of this series is that a lot of their magic is just science. Uh, they end up using gravity technology to make a black hole using two ancient gods, for example. Uh, in the process, they nonchalantly create the concept of entropy and doom, 
uh, every living thing to eventual extinction. Uh, you're gonna see a lot of crazy stuff like this uh, throughout the series. It feels grand. Um, it's enormous in scale and scope. And this is just a small example of the different types of races that are gonna exist in this series. So now let's talk about gods. Uh, so one of the coolest aspects of the magic and the universe here is that gods in Malazan are really just powerful beings that they all used to be mortals. Uh, any human or jagged or any other race uh, has the potential to ascend. Um, and they can do this by force. Um, they can steal the throne uh, of, some, of one of the realms or through worship. And the worship is the coolest part here because the act of believing in this world um, has the power to create and destroy gods. Um, if, if a particular being gets a lot of followers and believers, uh, they will let it literally turn into a god. And if they lose their followers, uh, they may end up losing that godhood or just becoming uh, totally ineffectual um, with their powers. Um, in a weird way, uh, the gods must bow to their followers uh, to get more power. It's a really, really fun concept uh, that you'll get a lot more depth on as the series progresses. So now let's talk in general about the powerful beings that exist in this universe. And my God, uh, does this series have some overpowered people. Uh, the philosophy in the series seems to be that when everybody is overpowered, uh, no one will be. Now this exists in a lot of different ways. Um, in many times in the series, you're gonna have um, whole armies go to battle and you're gonna see the biggest large scale magic wielding battles that ever existed with crazy beasts, dragons, just insane behaviors here. Um, and they'll be flinging these crazy magics and you're gonna be looking there thinking like, what are the soldiers on the front line? How can they possibly um, exist here? How can they play a part? But the magics counteract each other and in the end, it becomes the average regular person that can make or break the military and it's really fun. Um, so we're talking when, from powerful beings here, uh, anywhere from uh, the Prince of the Tistandi, I think like a version of like really powerful dark elves and they have dragon blood, like they can transform into a dragon whenever they want. Um, and this prince, he wields this sword called Dragnapur. And Dragnapur itself is a realm uh, which when, it, when somebody is slain with this sword, um, they are forced for eternity to pull a wagon um, with other people that have died here. And they're pulling themselves away from like this crazy force that you'll learn about later on. It, it, it's a crazy over the top concept. Um, and I say this all the time, but man, this book is just fun. Um, you have jaggets here with ice magic that can wave a hand and create entire armies turned into a glacier, for example. Um, it's just crazy. So before we wrap up this section about what Malazan's really about, let's talk a little general info here uh, about who wrote this story and, and how they wrote this story. So there were two very close friends here, uh, one of them named Steven Erickson and one named Ian C. Esselmont. And when they were younger, I want to say college, um, they had a Dungeons and Dragons campaign that they invented themselves. And it was this Malazan world. And they had lots of other friends that would participate with them. Um, and they had this insane campaign that lasted for many, many, many years. And they decided to film a movie based on this. Now the movie never got picked up. And instead of that, and thank God this happened, but they decided to write a book instead. Um, and Steven Erickson was the one that eventually wrote it. He wrote Gardens of the Moon, which is the first book um, in Malazan Book of the Fallen, which is you know the first 10 book series here. And over time, he started to write that and Ian Siesamont came in um, and he wrote kind of companion books here with a lot of the same characters, not going in the same exact timeline, um, well, yeah, same timeline, but not the same story. He'd branch off and talk about things that didn't get investigated in more detail. Um, because ultimately this covers an enormous world. This doesn't cover a country or a continent or a few continents. This covers a very, very, very large world and it really feels that way. So you get the sense here that there's like infinite stories that can be told. Um, and each of these authors is kind of doing their own thing. And it's a really cool way to go about it. Now let's move to the next section and this is going to be the pros and cons. Now the pros and cons might be flipped for you. Some of the things that I say and the pros here, you might look at that and say, yeah, I don't really like that. And some of these cons you're going to say, that's not con, that's a pro. But in general, I think this is what people think of 
uh, the experts of this series that you will hear talk about this. So the first pro is gonna be world building. The world building here, in my opinion, is the greatest that's ever been done. Um, now, I think when most people think of world building, they hold the standard up to be Lord of the Rings. And while I think the Lord of the Rings world building is like the best aspect of those books, and it is incredible, this really takes it to a whole nother level. You know, Lord of the Rings really feels like an incredibly fleshed out continent that has so many different places that we never even got to explore very much um, or at all. And it feels like there's tons of little stories going on um, everywhere you go. And this takes that to, uh, you know, and I hate to use this word so dramatically, but like an exponential level. It has entire continents that never get explored right. Um, you know, it, it will hover over some and every time you go somewhere, it's so rich and in depth. It's just, it marvels the reader um, to a level that you're never going to read um, at this point, and you're probably never going to read something like this again, given the depth that it took to write this story, and that it was kind of a lifelong project. That's not how books are written anymore. Um, I hope that, that they are at some point, and, and, and we get something even better than this. But the world building here is, is second to none. Um, the next pro that I will say is the prose. Um, this is the, the way the words are constructed here is just magical. You know, I, I think a lot of people that read Robin Hobb feel very similarly. They say, you know, she could write about anything and you would just eat it up. You know, it's, it's what people say about Patrick Rothfuss with Name of the Wind. Um, people criticize that book for, you know, the plot and some of the structure and the pacing, but everyone says that the prose is incredible. And th that's how it is here. Now, the interesting thing about Steven Erickson, and I'll talk about this later, but he's, you know, he studied philosophy. Um, in one of the things that he studied, and a lot of the things that he says are genius level philosophical musings um, that come out in extremely intelligent ways, not intelligent in the way that it's going to fly over your head, but intelligent in the way that you're going to read so many different things here that are going to blow you away in the way that they're written. And it's going to make you want, like if you have a Kindle, you're going to be highlighting stuff left and right. Um, if you have the feature on Kindle where you can see popular highlights, you're going to see them all the time because of how many things that are said that you just sit back and go, wow, that is impactful. How did you come up with this? I could spend my whole life and never come up with something like this. And he spews them off page after page after page. Now, Steven Erickson is better at this than Ian C. Estamont, but even then, um, Estamont's very good, but Steven Erickson takes it to a different level. Uh, another pro here is going to be the micro arcs. Now, this story could really be thought of as a lot of little stories all linked together. Now, there is an overarching story here. I don't want to claim that there's not, but that's not what's important here. What's important here is all the individual people here, and there are hundreds of them and hundreds of little stories here that are constantly being told. And that's where the magic lies. Um, you get these tons of beginning, middles, and ends to these, um, and there's so many special moments to be had, just random moments that don't feel connected to the bigger story, and a lot of times they're not, um, but they feel needed nonetheless. And I've never read anything that's really attempted to do something like this before, um, much less succeeded at it. Um, and you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about when you read the first book or two, and it kind of amplifies as the series goes along, but it is, it's a very special way of writing that is uh, a masterclass here. Um, another is the massive plot and the epicness. You are never going to read a more epic fantasy story than this one. I mean, you might have individual events that could take, you know, larger than life moments. You know, I think when a lot of people think of popular epic fantasy, they're going to think of a lot of like Brandon Sanderson stuff here. Um, but nothing comes to the level that Malazan, especially Malazan Book of the Fallen gets when it comes to this. And, and one of the reasons here is this term convergence that you're going to see all the time here. And essentially what that means in this series is that power attracts power. And when you read a Stormlight Archive book, for example, what you're going to find is this thing they call like the Sanderlanch, where at the end of the book, all of the characters are kind of coming together and they might have these different threads going on, but everyone works together to create this large scale, incredible either battle or event or something major that happens at the end of his books 
Well, this is where he got it from. And he didn't do it quite as well. And I say that as a huge Brandon Sanderson fan. But every single ending to each of these books almost one-ups the one prior to that. And, and they're very different. Some of them are tragic, you know, to the point where it's gonna be a major tearjerker, or if not tearjerker, you're just gonna set the book down and just go walk away and think about your life for a little bit. Some of them are gonna make you stand up and literally cheer, um, read it to believe it. But, you know, one of the, I guess, a con here is when you get to the last like 100 or 150 pages of each of these books, you, I promise you, you will not be able to put it down no matter what time it is. You'll stay up late. You'll do whatever you need to do to finish it because you just can't put it down. Um, another incredible thing here in the prose is the extremely creative magic and races and places. Uh, now we talked about the places here with the world building and I talked a little bit about the magic and the different races here um, when we were talking about what this series is all about. But you have to read it to really understand what's going on here because it's so terribly unique. Now it does get confusing because none of it has a resemblance to real life. Um, and they use these crazy terms that you're gonna have to kind of learn over time. Um, but it, it's crazy. You're gonna want to look up pictures of these different races to really visualize it for yourself. But they are the height of creativity. Uh, and I get why there was a Dungeons and Dragons campaign made around this. Um, and I can't believe the time and attention that went into making something so terribly unique here. Now, speaking of unique, uh, another enormous pro and one of my, probably the biggest pro that I would say about this is the characters that have a unique voice. There are literally hundreds of different point of view characters here. Now I'm not using hyperbole. There are literally hundreds, I think like 300 point of view characters. Um, now that may get confusing and we'll talk about that in the cons category, um, but they all are different. I don't understand how the authors here were able to differentiate these characters, make them all feel like real people um, without feeling repetitive any, in, in any way. Honestly, now I, I'm not gonna claim that I'm a good writer, I'm not. I don't write, I've never written a fantasy book, I never will. But honestly, I feel like if I was to write a book, you'd probably complain that a lot of my characters sounded the same and I'd probably have you know, one one hundredth the amount of point of view characters that are here. It's crazy. Um, now, another is the humor. Now, this is a dark fantasy book. I, I wouldn't classify it as grimdark because there is a lot of hope here. And grimdark kind of is the opposite of that. Grimdark kind of lacks that hope. Um, and, and I'm not sure if that's the definition of grimdark, but that's what I think of when I think of grimdark. But somehow there is a lot of humor that gets infused here. So much to the point where I almost promise you that you're gonna laugh more in these books than you've ever laughed in any book. And it feels so out of place because you know this juxtaposition with you know dark, dark events with humor that goes along with them. And some of the humor exists in this kind of military type humor where these people are thrown into such crazy events um, that they can't help but make light of it. Now, this is something that exists in real life. You, if you, you're a fan of um, military history, you'll find a lot of examples, um, you know, kind of more recently in like World War I, World War II, um, where the soldiers had, had to see so much violence and negativity um, that they kind of laughed about so much of it. And, and you see that here and it's really, really well done. Uh, but that's not the only humor here. You have some characters, especially the characters that pop up in book five, and they exist for several books here, but they're the greatest comedy fantasy duo that's ever existed. Um, now you might think that I'm referring to two different duos because there are two different funny duos here, but you know, uh, when I say book five, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and the last thing I will say is the depth, if you want it. Um, the depth here is, is insane. This, when I say this world is a true world, I'm not talking about just the width of the world, I'm talking about the depth as well. Um, when you go to a different location, for example, it really gives that feeling like, you know, they have their own unique religion, their, their unique heroes, their unique stuff that makes them who they are, when their neighbors could have a totally different thing. Um, and you're not gonna get all of it perfectly explained to you, um, but that's real life too and you really get the sense that you're there with them, but the depth of this world is, is incredible. So now let's go over the cons. Um, all right, there aren't any, let's move on. <laughs> no, uh, there are cons. And I, now I don't really think of these as cons myself, but um, I'm trying to be unbiased in a lot of this, and I wanna tell you what, what a lot of people say are the cons. Now, I talked about the micro arcs and the pros, but the macro arcs I think should be in the con column because it takes many books 
for the main story to really get started. And that's kind of crazy. These are not small books. Each of these books is around like a thousand pages, maybe a little bit less than the, you know, 900 or so. So you're, you're reading s several thousand pages before you really see where the plot is going. And if you're a, a if you really like your plots to go from A to B, uh, you're not gonna see that here. Eventually it will get there. Um, if you have trust in the author here, it will pay off. Um, but this story is about the micro arcs. The story is about individual characters having their own stories to be told. It's not really about what's going on in the wider world. It eventually gets there. Um, but I wouldn't say that's what this is really all about. Um, this is also extremely confusing, especially at the beginning. Now, a lot of people will call this the hardest fantasy book that exists, and maybe it is. Um, a lot of people say it might be the most confusing fantasy book there is, and maybe it is. Um, and I, when you hear a lot of people talk about this series, and I've watched a lot of reviewers um, say, you know, it's not that confusing, it's overblown. I, I don't agree, it is confusing. Now, I, I happen to like that. I like being confused. I don't want my hand being held. I want to figure things out. I want to uncover the mysteries of this world without these enormous info dumps. Now the info dumps do happen and we'll talk about them, but they don't happen in the first book or the second or the third or maybe the fourth. Um, you know, you find out about things when the character finds out about them, um, but it can feel very confusing. It, it, it's, he's, Steven Erickson, when he wrote Book of the Fallen, did not write it thinking, you know, how can I make this clear um, to the reader? You know, I think when a lot of authors write their books, they're constantly revising things, saying like, will my readers understand? And I think when Steven Erickson wrote this book, he said, I don't care if they understand. That's not why I'm writing this book. I'm writing this book so that they can trust me as an author to get them to understand eventually. But that's part of the reason I love this series is that you just get dropped into the world and you're told, figure it out. Um, now this is, a, this is a pretty big con for a lot of people and there is um, sexual violence in this book. Now it doesn't exist all over the place, but there are some very stark examples of this. Um, and you know, I'll never forget them. They're so impactful. I do think that they're very important to the story. They're not thrown in there gratuitously. They, they tell a very important character arc, not just for the person that perpetrated these horrible acts, but for the victim as well, and uh, and how it transforms them as people. Now, you do get a lot of amazing redemption arcs here, um, a lot of them, and that can make these more impactful in a good way. Um, but if you have, you know, a problem with sexual violence, you know, you're gonna have some problems with this book. Now, I think they can probably be avoided if you do a little reading into it. Um, and we'll talk about how to find things, but I'll just throw it out there, you know, if you were to want to avoid this, you can go on to the Malazan subreddit or the Malazan Discord, um, and they can walk you through how to avoid this, what chapters to maybe avoid, or what pages to avoid, um, so that you don't have to go through that. But um, if you don't have a particular um, you know, trigger for these type of things, I do think they're important to the story. Um, they also, you know, I talked about in the pros about um, the pros. Uh, about how philosophical they can get and in a very important way. But in some of the books, they it can become overly philosophical. Now, if you're in really into philosophy, you're gonna eat that up the more it exists. For me, where I like some of it, it you know, there are some books here, one in particular, and I'll talk about it later, that, you know, it was almost hard for me to read, not in Malazan Book of the Fallen, in one of the other series. And again, we'll talk about all these different series within the series. Um, but, but yeah, some of them can get a little too much. Um, I also touched on this, but the amount of characters, you know, there's, I want to say there's like a thousand characters, maybe like 900. There's 400 point of views. Um, you know, that's daunting. And a lot of people look at that and say, they say, that's too confusing. I don't want to go down that. Now there's ways to mitigate this. There's way, there's notes, there's, um, there's websites you can look at to refresh yourself on some of these people. Um, but yeah, when, when I think when a lot of people hear that, they can get kind of turned off to the story. Um, and the last thing I'll say in the cons is this is a huge series and this can take you months or years to read. Uh, if you are reading 30 pages a day, uh, this series will take you about one year to read. Um, that's a big investment. Now, if you love the series, um, you're gonna say, it's not enough, I wanna read more. Uh, but, but yeah, if you don't, 
if you want to read a lot. So let's move on to the next section, and I like to call this one, should you be intimidated? Uh, no. No, you should not. Um, for a lot of reasons. Now, this does sound intimidating to be confusing at first. Over time, you will understand it. It will make sense. Maybe not every single little part, but that's the beauty of rereads. But overall, you're going to understand the series by the time it finishes, and probably well before then. Um, but at, at the beginning, like I said, it drops you into the middle of nowhere and doesn't hold your hand. Um, you know, most reviewers that, that talk about the series claims it's not hard. That's just not true. Um, it is hard, but that's okay. Um, and, but you don't need to stress out about that. Just jump in and put trust in the author to lead you along the way. Um, the author does not hold your hand. He, he lets you run at first and then he coaches you later on. Um, are you feeling lost while you read this? Um, yeah, you should be. And so are the characters that you follow. Um, you don't get point of views of characters here that would typically be like the protagonists in other stories um, or like major characters. Instead, you're going to see their sidekicks, um, their confidants, the soldiers uh, with their boots on the ground, um, the gods that are entangled by their decisions, um, and, and those that have to carry out or deal with the fallout of their choices. Uh, and you aren't given any expositions that explain the world, the characters, the magic, or the gods. Um, you experience events and conversations, and you form your own ideas on how this works bit by bit. Um, it's immersive to take on these mysteries and these puzzles of the world. Uh, th the questions that you have during the series, they're, well, they're the same questions that these characters have themselves. Um, there are info dumps. I talked about that earlier. Um, they just come several books in in the form of characters that are making these discoveries for themselves. It doesn't just all of a sudden kind of ham-fisted come at you like a lot of other books do. It feels very natural. Um, it's really satisfying uh, when you make the conclusions over several books and then they match those info dumps. So there are resources out there, um, and that's going to be the next portion of this video, um, that make things more clear, um, that can really help you not feel so stressed or intimidated about reading this series. Um, and really, you could read this series any way you want. Um, do you want to understand every little thing like some of those like Lord of the Rings geeks? I say that with a lot of love. I'm a geek. Um, well, you can. You can totally do that. You can take your time, you can reread, you can research, you can figure out everything on your first read through. Um, do you wanna read from the beginning to the end without stressing at all and t or taking notes or just like pile through? Yeah, you can do that too. Um, and you're gonna get, you know, 70, 80% of all the little things that go on here, which is plenty enough. Um, do you want something in between, which is like me? Um, yeah, you can do that too. So any way that you wanna read this book, you can. All right, for this next section, we are going to go over my six reading tips to really make this whole reading experience more enjoyable. Um, and a lot of these are really, really important. Um, and the most important one is the first one. And the first one is use the PowerPoint that exists for this series. There is an amazing PowerPoint. Um, I don't think it's actually PowerPoint, it's like Google Slides. Um, anybody can, can read it. Um, and I will link all of these things down in the video description down below, so check that out. And all of these, um, tips are all spoiler free things as well, but this PowerPoint will walk you through every step of the way. Um, it'll give a few different slides in every chapter, nothing too overwhelming. Um, it'll share maps that you don't get in the book, uh, pictures, main points, and things that you just do not want to miss. Now there is not one of these things for every book in the series. It goes through book six, but I would also say that by the time that you finish book six and before then, you're going to be gliding through this. You're going to understand what's going on. You don't need this anymore, but it does exist through that point. And everybody needs to use the PowerPoint. It's, um, you know, you'll spend a few minutes per slide after you finish a chapter, um, and then you can just power on through the next one. Um, the next thing, and, and this is a step up from the previous one, and on Tor, the website, there is a read-along. Um, it, it's with one veteran of the series who's read this at least once, um, but I think multiple times, and one new reader. And they do a long summary of every single chapter on every point in the chapter. So it's like the PowerPoint, but way more detail. And then after that summary, um, each of them give their thoughts. And again, all of this is spoiler free. Have at it. You're not going to spoil anything for you unless you read ahead. Um, and so, yeah, if you want something a little more powerful than the PowerPoint, do the tour read along. Now, the only thing I'll say is on the bottom of their thoughts, like people can comment, avoid those. I've seen spoilers there. Just read the actual, you know, article itself, but avoid the comments. 
Um, now, the most time investment thing you can do is a podcast. There is this podcast, I'm sure there's multiple, but the one that I prefer is called 10 Very Big Books. And this is for friends who are doing a podcast um, and they're almost done with, I think the last book or the second to last book. Um, and there's one veteran in the series and three new readers. Um, each episode is like an hour to an hour and a half and they cover like a handful of chapters uh, in each episode. And so, you know, when I was first reading this series, I really liked it. I would, you know, when I was driving from point A to point B, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd finish the chapters and then I'd kind of listen to that and it would really fill you in um, and find a lot of things that you wouldn't find in the, the other things here. So if you really want to understand like everything, you know, that's, that's a great place to do it. Another cool thing is um, after they finish a book, they'll do an interview with Steven Erickson and talk about the book in a lot more detail. So that's always a lot of fun to, to, to listen along to as well. Um, I, the fourth tip is use the Malazan wiki page. This is malazan.fandom.com. Again, I will put all links to all of these things down below. Now, most of the time on wiki pages, there's going to be spoilers abound. I have been spoiled so many times, uh, reading other series, you know, and it's just like right at the beginning, you'll read about a character and like, boom, oh wait, they destroyed the world later on. Like, oh no. And now I ruined everything. Uh, no, this is the greatest wiki page I've ever seen for any fantasy series. They go through painstaking detail to make it so new readers can come and get a value here. So check it out. Now there are some things to know. Um, there are spoilers there, but they will announce them. They'll put huge red letters, spoilers following. You know, it's separated by books. So if you wanna just read about Gardens of the Moon, you can read about each character and their involvement there. It's super helpful when you find a character that you're kind of not familiar with and who is this person again? Go to the wiki, check it out, you're fine. Now, if you read too far, you can kind of get spoiled. And the way that I like to use the wiki is, um, and I'll show a little video here um, and, and walk you through this, but at the very bottom of the wiki page, like any wiki page, you'll see um, the footnotes and they'll have little numbers there and they'll show you what chapters that they cover. So if you want to read, for example, um, you know, only up to chapter three, we'll go to the bottom, find chapters one and two, what footnotes do those associate with and go read those footnotes, knowing full well that the only things they're going to spoil are things that you have already read. Um, now let's do my fifth tip. And my fifth tip is um, if you have any specific questions, go to reddit.com slash r slash malazin. And it's a beautiful resource. It's super active. You can ask any question you want. Everybody is super kind to new readers. Um, get as specific as you want. Within you know minutes, you will have some quality responses to really fill you in on anything that you needed filled in. Um, now, on that vein, you can also use the Malazan Discord. The Malazan Discord um, is great. There's tons of people and you can get answers right away to anything. There's non-spoiler rooms you can go into, people use spoiler tags. Um, it's beautiful. Um, also, check out my Discord um, while you're at it. Um, I talk about Malazan with other people that are reading along this right now. I'm happy to answer any questions as well. And again, links at the bottom. Um, the second to last tip that I have for you, I think I'm over six now, but whatever, um, is take notes. Uh, you don't have to do this, I did. And when I say take notes, I don't mean write every little thing that happened. What I mean is the way I like to take notes is, and I physically wrote it in the back of the book. Now, a lot of people don't like to scratch up their books. That's fine, write it wherever you want. But you know, there's a lot of different point of views. And a lot of times you're not gonna get back to that point of view for a while. And you might forget what happened, especially if you're reading a little bit slowly. So I would write like the, the point of view and some main points about what happened in that chapter. You know, nothing more than like a sentence and where they ended up at the end of their point of view. So that, you know, when I finally get back to, you know, Calum and I don't remember what calum has been up to, I'll just go to the Calum section, what happened at the very end. And I was like, oh, refresher, I'm back on page. Let's go Calum, let's figure out what you're doing. Super helpful. Um, and the last thing, uh, it's okay to be confused. It happens, uh, don't worry about it. Um, you just have to trust that the important facts will all be made clear upon finishing the series. So don't stress. It's fine. If you don't want to do any of these, that's fine. Just don't worry about being confused. It happens. It's part of the experience. All right. For the next section of this video, we are going to talk about the six different sub series within Malazan. It is not just Malazan Book of the Fallen. There are six. Um, let's go through them. So I've already spent a lot of time talking about Malazan Book of the Fallen. It is already completed. It is 10 really big books long. Um, so I'm not going to kind of dwell on that anymore. 
Um, Carcanus is a trilogy. Carcanus, um, there's two books done. Um, I think the third book is the next book that's going to come out from Steven Erickson. Um, and everything I'm going to talk about right now in this section is Steven Erickson. So this series serves as like a prequel, like a really far back prequel to Book of the Fallen. And it tells the story of the Tist, the Jagged, and the Azanthi. I don't know how to say that. I didn't listen. I read. Um, 300,000 years before the Malazan Empire began their conquest of Genobacchus. Um, this book takes place over hundreds of thousands of years. Um, the history, not the books themselves, but there's tons of history here. Um, the focus is on characters like Anamander Rake, Draconis, Hood, Gothos, and K. Rule. Um, and the series draws inspiration from the Shakespearean declamation style. Um, and it's framed as being told from one poet to another. Now, I, I have a lot of mixed feelings about this series so far. I really, really, really like the first book. And I really, really, really did not like the second book. The second book just felt it's what, earlier in the video when I was talking about um, one of the books goes too philosophical. This is the one. It just, you know, it was too much. Um, I read it. I finished it. But I'm not super looking forward to the third book in this. I'll read it. Um, but, but yeah, it just, you know, it, it took plot aside and just went, you know, philosophical musings. It really took that poet thing to a different level. Um, the next trilogy here is Witness. Um, this is the most recent. Um, there's only one book so far, and this serves as a sequel to Malazan Book of the Fallen. It features a very famous character that I don't want to say now because I don't want to ruin like the fate of characters here. A lot of people die in this series. A lot of people die. Um, so I don't want to say like, oh, it's about this. And you'll know that they have plot armor when you read this. But if you want to know who I'm talking about, join the Discord. I'll talk about it all day. Um, but... Um, unlike the main series, um, the Witness Trilogy is really going to be like one giant novel split up into three. Um, and so, but yeah, it's, uh, so, but I've only read one of them. I liked it a lot. Um, it features a lot of very well-known characters. Uh, and, and yeah, I really liked the first book. It was awesome. It wasn't quite to the level of The Last Book of the Fallen, but it was great. I had an amazing time and I would recommend it to everybody. Um, and the last series written by Steven Erickson is The Tales of Bachelain and Corbel Brooch. These are seven books. Um, I don't know if there's more going to be written. Um, maybe. Um, and one of them is not published. It is in shorthand. You can read it on Facebook. Kind of weird. I can't really read shorthand, so I never read it. Um, now, this is a series of darkly comedic novellas that follow the adventures um, of the necromancers, uh, Corbel Brooch and Bachelain and their long-suffering manservant, Emancipor Reese. Um, they take place in the same universe as Malazan Book of the Fallen um, and novels of the Malazan Empire, um, with Bajolain, Brooch, and Reese briefly appearing in Memories of Ice and an Orb Scepter Throne. Um, but these are really side stories. They're not critical to the story, and I love them. Now, the first book in this series is not good, and it makes you feel like, oh man, this is so bad. Um, but after that point, it is like top tier comedy. It's the hardest I've ever laughed from the beginning to end in books is in these books. Um, it's somehow these like horrifically brutal horror stories, but somehow over the top hilarious. They're super, super fun. Uh, and uh, not a lot of people have read these, and I cannot recommend them enough to veterans of this series. Now let's switch over to Ian C. Esselmont, the other author here. I um, mean, he has two different series. The first that he wrote is a completed series. It's six books long, and it is Novels of the Malazan Empire. Now this is in the same, you know, universe as Malazan, Book of the Fallen, with a lot of overlapping characters. And it's really fun to read these because um, it's fun to see this different take on a similar character. Um, the series is, like I said, six books, and they start with this small novel, Night of Knives, and they progressively get more complex as you go along. Uh, a number of the locations and storylines followed um, are alluded to in Malazan Book of the Fallen, uh, but they don't really get into depth. And so with lands like Coral and Jakaruku and Asail, and to some extent uh, Quantali, um, that are really explored here. Now, I love this series. I, I think a lot of people are hesitant to read Ian C. Asimov because he's not Steven Erickson. They're like, how can anything be as good? Well, they're not, but they're still amazing. Um, and, you know, there were so many times in Book of the Fallen where, you know, characters would be going from point A to point B. And, you know, some characters would diverge. They'd go off and do their own thing and they never show up again. And, that, and that's real life. 
but it, it, I'm like, well, I want to know about what happened to that character. I felt like they were main character, and now, you know, what are we, what are we, where are we going with this? And this book, a lot of the time, will go investigate that character and tell you what they went and did, um, and I loved that. Um, multiple times here, you know, it it scratched this itch I had in a really good way. Um, the other series that's written by Ian C. Elsamont, it's a book series that is, I think, going to be six books. There's four done. Um, I think the next one comes out in 2023, and this is Path to Ascendancy. Now, this is another prequel series, not nearly as far as the other one I talked about with hundreds of thousands of years, um, but this is a prequel series that um, talks about the events leading up to the foundation of the Malazan Empire. Um, and it's expected to conclude around the same time just before Garden to the Moon begins. Um, so... Yeah, it's it, it's a it should kind of be like the end of uh, what was that Star Wars movie that came out recently where it ended and then A New Hope started like right right there, and uh, and so yeah that should be a really fun concept. Um, it, it's not so much like a series prequel, but it's a prequel about Kelvin Ben and Dancer, um, that like the de facto leaders of the Malazan Empire at the start of Gardens of the Moon. And I love this one. This is uh, you know, far superior, I think, to the novels of Malazan Empire. Uh, I, I love it dearly. I didn't realize how much I wanted to read more about these characters. Um, and it's just amazing. I love how big and, and broad these stories are and they really, really hit home. All right, now we are gonna talk about the reading order, uh, my recommended reading order. And you know, I think a lot of people would say what I'm about to say, but, but let's just get into it. And so this reading order I'm gonna talk about is for first time readers. If you're a rereader, there are many, many, many different ways you can read these that are really fun. Um, I plan on doing a reread, and when I do, I'm probably gonna mix a lot of them up in like chronological timeline. Um, but when you're a new reader, you gotta read Molasses Book of the Fallen first. You gotta read those 10 books, even though they are not the beginning or the end of the series, uh, and there's a lot of books in between, this is the way to do it because it won't spoil anything for you. A lot of the other books will reference things and it's just so much better to do those 10 books first. Now after that, there, you can do a pick them. You can read in any order you want. It's really about what you're interested in. So um, when you're done with this, you know, are you interested in the lands that aren't covered in detail in Book of the Fallen? Well then you need to read um, Novels of the Malazan Empire. Um, although not Knight of Knives first. Um, if you read Knight of Knives first, you're gonna not like it as much as the other ones, and it might turn you off to Ian C. Elsamont. It's the only, so in Novels of the Malazan and Empire, I think there's like six books, um, five of them talk about like a, a cohesive story. One of them is like a prequel thing, and that's Knight of Knives. So read Knight of Knives when you're done, or somewhere later on, but don't start with it. Um, start with, I think it's uh, the, the Crimson Guard. Uh, and so, uh, next, you know, are you interested in the Tiss, the Jagged, um, the Xanthi? Are you interested in Anamander Rake and Draconis and Hood and Gothos and K. Rule? Read Carcanus. Um, are you interested in what happens on Genobacus after Malaz and Book of the Fallen? Uh, read Witness. Um, are you interested in the history of how the Malazan Empire came into power? Um, are you interested in the history of the main characters in Malaz and Book of the Fallen and their leadership stru um, structure? Uh, read Path to Ascendancy. And are you interested in Bachelain and Corbel Brooch? You, you want to laugh? Um, then read the tales of Bachelain and Corbel Brooch. So it's really like, what do you want? Um, go read those. That's what you do. But read the 10 books first. All right, for my final section in this video, I am going to be going over the 28 books that I've read. There's really 29 books, but like I said, one of them is not published. It's written in shorthand. I don't have time for it. So these are the 28 books all combined in categories. So the first category, I'm going to start at the bottom, and these are what I would consider the bad books. Um, and there's not very many of them, but the bottom, number 28, is Cracked Pot Trail. This is part of Botulin and Corbel Brooch. Um, I'm not going to talk about any spoilers here. I'll just give really broad strokes here, but uh, I, the writing style here just didn't work for me. It is in the form of a traveling troupe of like singers and they're telling stories to each other. So it's a lot of like little stories and it just brought me out of the grand scope here and I, and I kind of hated it. Um, number 27 is Fall of Light. This is the second book in Carcanus. This is the one I talked about earlier that is just far too philosophical for my tastes. Uh, number 26 is Blood Follows. This is uh, Botchland and Corwell Brooch. This is the first book in the series. Um, I just couldn't figure out where they're going with the story. It was too much setup not enough humor, 
just kind of weird. Um, and the last in the bad category, uh, number 25, is Blood and Bone. Um, this is, I think it's the last book in Novels of the Malazan Empire. And it had that Malazan feel to it, but it just was dire uh, without any of the positivity that I associate with a lot of Malazan. Um, you know, it just was a brutal read and I, and I didn't get any of the payoff that I come to expect. Um, so the next category, it's a short one, and these are the books that I would consider just okay. Um, and number 24 is Night of Knives. Um, this is part of Novels of Lamaze and Empire. This is the first one. And this tells the immediate prequel to Malaz and Book of the Fallen and kind of like what happened in the with Caliban and Dancer. I don't want to say anything to spoil anything. I wish I could, but it just it was clearly his first book. He gets a lot better um, in C.L. Samant, but it started out kind of rough. Um, and number 23 is A Sale. This is again part of Novels and Laws and Empire by Ian C. Elsamont. Um, this one is, it's just okay. Um, it had some nice parts to it. It had some nice world building. Just didn't really get the payoff that I come to expect. The next category is The Good. Um, and starting with number 22, this is Fiends of Nightmaria. This is one of the Botulin and Corbel Brooch stories. I thought it was very funny. Um, not quite reaching the laughs and the plot that I would that I liked in some of the other Botulin and Corbel Brooch stories, but a very good story nonetheless. Uh, number 21 is Forge of Darkness. This is the first in the Carcanus series. Um, I really like the story. I, I don't like love the characters that it talks about, just like on my own personal tastes but I love the plot here. It was very engaging and it made me really interested to keep going in the series. Uh, number 20 is The God Is Not Willing. This is the only book in the Witness series um, and it's a much smaller scope of a story but a really good plot. Um, and number 19 is Dust of Dreams. This is the uh, first showing up here from the Book of the Fallen. This is the second to last book. And a big reason that I have this so low on my list, even though it's in the Book of the Fallen, is that it's not like it's different than all the other ones because originally this was supposed to be a nine book series, I believe, and books nine and 10 were supposed to be one like 2000 page book. And the publishers looked at that and they said, no way, we're not publishing a 2000 page book, split it. And so it doesn't have that same feel uh, that you would feel with all that big convergence and a beginning, middle and end, it just kind of ends. And you know, if it was one big book, it would have been awesome. But yeah, the, the random cutting off uh, you know, hurt the story, but it was still a great book. Um, now, let's go to the very good. Um, starting with number 18, The Healthy Dead. This is Botchland and Corbel Brooch. Um, it is absolutely hilarious. I loved every single part about this. It made me laugh really, really hard. Uh, number 17 is Stone Wielder. This is part of uh, Novels of the Malazan Empire. Uh, this felt like a real Malazan book. This is uh, one of the better books from Ian C. Esselmont. Uh, it just works on so many levels, and I love the main character here, there's a few main characters, but if you read this, you'll know what I'm talking about. Don't want to spoil anything, but I love this character and I love finding out uh, what they were up to um, after they left the main story. Um, number 16 is Dancer's Lament. Um, this is part of Path to Ascendancy. It is the first book in Path to Ascendancy. Um, it's not rated higher because it took a little while to get started, but once it does, it really pops off. Uh, number 15 is Gardens of the Moon. This is the first book of the Fallen book, and I really liked it. It's just really confusing. Now, if I were to go back and reread it, I'd probably be obsessed because I'd get it now. But I haven't reread it, and so I'm rating it based on how I first read it. And I loved it, but I was very confused. Uh, number 14 is Dead House Landing. Um, I think this is the second book in uh, Path to Ascendancy. And this is where things, I mean, I'm really hooked into the characters now and the plot. It just, it, it just, it works so well. Uh, number 13 is Kelvin's Reach. And I think this is the most recent Path to Ascendancy book and just brought it to another level. Uh, number 12 is The Lees of Laughter's End. This is a Botchland and Corbel Brooch story. And this is they're on a ship the whole time. Oh man, do I love ships. And it's, uh, it's brutal, it's hilarious. Uh, some of the best comedy that I've ever read in any book. And I, I one joke in particular that I'll never forget. Uh, number 11, The Worms of Bleermouth, the last that I have here from Botulin and Corbel Brooch, uh, just a perfect comedy. Uh, number 10 is Orb, Scepter, Throne, uh, the last book that I have on this list. I love uh, finding out about so many characters that got abandoned in Book of the Fallen that I love, some of my favorite characters. I got to find out what they were up to. And now the last group. These are the Incredibles, uh, the best of the best. Uh, number nine is Dead House Gates. This is, all these are Malazan Book of the Fall now. Um, and 
I can't really spoil anything, but uh, the ending of this book in particular will uh, stick with me forever. Uh, number eight is, actually I was wrong. Uh, number eight is Return of the Crimson Guard. This is novels of the Malazan Empire. This is my favorite of the novels. It felt every bit as good as Steven Erickson books. Uh, just, just like a perfect book. Um, number seven is House of Chains. This is uh, the fourth book and covers one of my favorite books in the series. They get their debut here, a very controversial character, but one that I love nonetheless. Uh, number six is Toll the Hounds. Uh, this is another controversial book because um, when you read this book, the first two thirds of this book feel like, what is happening? Well, this feels different than the other ones. Now it turns out that um, Stephen Erickson's dad died uh, right before he wrote this book. So he was in a different headspace. He wrote very philosophical and um, I didn't love it. Now the last third of this is the best third of a book that I've ever read ever. It's the greatest stuff that I've ever read in my life. And it's, it's just, it's magical. Um, you can't put it down for like 200 pages. Um, number six, uh, number five is Midnight Tides. Uh, I think this is also the fifth book in the series. Um, this is a brand new story arc. Uh, they, you spent four books learning about a bunch of characters and the fifth book they're like, nope, let's go somewhere else and talk about new characters. It makes sense eventually, uh, but I, I, I think it's like the best individual story uh, out of the books and I loved it. Um, number four is Reaper's Gale. Reaper's Gale takes um, Midnight Tides and continues that story. And there are so many things that got time to set up in Midnight Tides that really get their conclusion here in Reaper's Gale. Uh, number three is The Bone Hunters. Um, the Bone Hunters has some of the best writing that I've ever read. Um, there is a section of this book which is going to be one of my top like three most memorable things that ever happened in Book of the Fallen. And the whole military campaign here was just wonderful. Uh, number two is Memories of Ice, a lot of people's favorite book in the series. Uh, just a banging book from beginning to end. And number one is my favorite book of all time, The Crippled God. The final book, um, the, the most beautiful conclusion that I've ever read. It's just the perfect way to cap off this story. Um, so that is the end of my video. I hope that I have informed you. I hope I have convinced you uh, to finally jump into Book of the Fallen. If you have already reading it, I hope I've convinced you to keep reading. And if you've finished Book of the Fallen and you have not read some of the other books, I hope I've convinced you that there are other amazing books in the series that you should go read. And finally, if you've already read all these books, I hope I've convinced you to do a reread. Um, so thank you so much for bearing with me over this very long video. And as always, happy reading to you. Thanks again to my patrons with a special shout out to my Ascendant tier patrons, Sky, Russell, Ron Reich, Romeo Mike, and CJ.